put this wonderful panel together and he wanted me to tell you that he attended his first peace demonstration as a high school student in 1965 and he's been working at it ever since. Thank you. Thanks, Ellis. Um, so welcome. We have a, a, a terrific uh, agenda and, uh, and hopefully you will all contribute to this evening. Um, I want to welcome you to, uh, to this meeting. The, uh, the purpose of the meeting is to try to figure out how we stop the U.S. occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we have uh, a marvelous uh, group of um, uh, people, speakers here tonight. Uh, on my left is Dr. Dahlia Waspi, who is an Iraqi American physician. Uh, on my right is Michael Schwartz, a professor of sociology at Stony Brook University. And on uh, my far left, Dan Black, um, a U.S. Uh, a former U.S. Marine uh, and veteran of the Iraq occupation. So uh, the way we're going to handle this uh, meeting, each of the speakers will have approximately 15 minutes each. And um, uh, hopefully by then, Congresswoman Maloney will have come by and she can speak for, uh, for a short time. Uh, then we're going to have a few announcements and uh, then open the discussion to the floor. So um, then it's up to you to comment or question. Um, I'll keep pretty strict time to give everybody a chance to, uh, to speak. Um, your questions won't be answered by the, uh, the speakers up here uh, immediately, um, but can be addressed by um, all the attendees. Um, after the uh, question and answer, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the comment and question segment, then, uh, then each of the speakers will speak for approximately five minutes to wrap up. Um, then I'll give the meeting back to Alice Slater, who will introduce some, some people here tonight and, um, and uh, also give some announcements about where we take this uh, movement from here. Let me just uh, check my notes, make sure I'm not forgetting anything, and then we can move on to our first speaker. Well, yeah, one important thing is before, uh, while uh, our speakers are speaking, we're going to pass a hat around or um, some bowl or something to uh, help defray expenses for this meeting. Uh, after, we'll do that at the end. Okay. You know, we won't interrupt okay. um, our speaking. If, if anybody has to leave early, please leave a contribution at the, uh, at the table here or at the, uh, at the table by the entrance. Um, this, uh, this meeting did cost us about $400 to produce, so we do want to um, not have the organizers of the meeting have to, uh, you know, have the bill all to themselves, but we want to share that. Okay, um, I'd like to now um, introduce our first speaker, uh, Daniel J. Black, um, and you know, welcome him. He's, uh, he's one of the good guys. He's somebody who uh, joined the military and uh, then learned from his experience, and now he's working and fighting to end this war. Dan. Thank you all. That was a sign. Should I use that one instead? Oh, okay. I'll sit in. Sorry. Thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, I was asked by Evan in an, in an email to, um, to cover in 15 minutes something that I think could fill about an entire series of volumes in the Library of Congress.
Congress, and that is, um, you know, how do we end the war in Iraq, and how do we prevent further wars of uh, aggression? How do we address the issue of U.S. imperialism in general? And then also thrown into that was the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and, um, and I was very, uh, I was very honored to be invited to speak on those subjects. And wish that it was more than 15 minutes. So I'll try to move quickly through uh, what I have to speak about. Uh, my, it's only fair to tell you all that I haven't been to Iraq since 2004. Uh, it's been almost four years, and I, it's, it's very different on the ground today than it was when I was there. Much has changed, much hasn't changed. Um, just to let you know, so if you want to ask me questions about it, like today or yesterday, I'm not the guy to ask. But I can tell you that I've been in, in communication with a lot of people who, are, who are, have been there within the past uh, months, and the situation so far as I've been told by very credible sources, uh, has deteriorated. And uh, reg especially regarding troop morale and the efficiency of the military, the way that uh, the personnel of the military behave. Uh, the problem with prolonged military conflicts such as these with this country or any country uh, is that with time and with the troops becoming steadily more uh, bored and disgruntled and dissatisfied so increases the number of human rights abuses. And that's a uh, principal concern of mine in that, uh, that I want the troops to come home as soon as possible. That's one of the principal reasons. Uh, I was discharged from the Marines in August of 2005. I, I pride myself in saying that they were glad to get rid of me and I was glad to get rid of them. Uh, I was offered the opportunity to re-enlist and that was a good laugh. But um, it was the culture of the military that actually had had me the most um, turned off to it by then. I was not very politicized by the conflict, but I, in, in recognizing the way that the military functions, has always functioned, and, and I'm sure it continues to function, uh, it, it is not, I'm sure you can all imagine, it is not as it's portrayed in these, in these recruiting campaigns, in these, these movies that you see uh, with John Wayne and such. Um, there is only one core value, and that is obedience. And when you step outside of your, your command's good graces, as I had on a number of occasions, inadvertently at first, uh, you, you realize very quickly what's, what's valued and what's not valued in the military. And this is what we need to understand about our own troops, our own young men and women who are put into these circumstances. Uh, and these are, these are not bad people on the whole, but rather they are in, in, in very extraordinary situations which uh, account largely for what's going on that's wrong. This is not to excuse what they do, but this is to say that if we want these things to cease, that we need to, to change the situations, change the circumstances. And that's why, essentially, the troops need to come home as soon as possible, because we are making bad people out of young people by putting them into these uh, situations. Um, after being discharged, I started college uh, immediately, and then, and then I, became, I became involved in the anti-war movement gradually over time. And what I found, this was about two and a half years ago, and it's, it's, been, it's been good and bad. We've, we've had some victories. I think that we've seen a sea change in public thought, which is fantastic. And, uh, and then there's some disappointments in the only measure that I, that I really consider the most relevant, the number of troops and the, the amount of time that we continue to be involved in Iraq, uh, it has not turned toward what I would consider a preferable uh, situation. So my focus is on how do we effect the change we want in that measure. I think it is fantastic that uh, since my becoming involved in the anti-war movement, the uh, number of, of Americans that are against the war has increased substantially. Uh, that's, that's a great job, we can pat ourselves on the back for that. But as far as the, the campaign is concerned, um, we, we need to keep working, keep working very hard because uh, that has not changed. In fact, it's gotten worse. Not only do we have to keep working hard, but we need to reconsider what it is we're doing. Uh, because what we are doing, what we have been doing for five years, is abundantly clear to me and many people that I've talked to that uh, the government the real decision makers, whoever has this, this operation continuing is not affected 
by the public will, whether it's, it's a minority or a majority, whether it's a sizable majority that wants immediate withdrawal, um, there doesn't seem to be any connection between the will of the people and the actions of our leadership. So, you know, I tend to pose the question, is it a good idea to continue investing resources in trying to reach that final 20 or 25 or 30 percent that we haven't won over yet, when the 70 percent that we've got so far doesn't seem to sway our leadership? And how does, how does a citizen who feels disempowered, as I do, uh, stop a war crime that is on the scale of the war in Iraq? And that question has, has answers, and one of the answers is to change your strategy. When you're, when you're doing something, and you're trying to accomplish a goal, and your, your means of, of accomplishment are not working, it makes sense to try something else. And, um, and that's a question that I struggle with. It's a question that we should all struggle with if we want to see that change. Um, I've been very disappointed at some of the actions that I've been to, I'll, I'll be candid with you all, that uh, it's, it's not always a pleasure to be involved in something when you can't distract yourself from this nagging belief of yours that you're not working toward an objective and that you're, you're treading water or you're losing ground or your, your actions and your energies and your enthusiasm are just entirely misdirected. And that happens from time to time. And more people, we can forgive ourselves for making mistakes. But I hope that to consider that critically is why we're all here. Evan told me that the anti-war movement is losing momentum, and that's why we need to get together and ask ourselves, what is happening? What do we need to do? We still want this war to end, and how can we, how can we get that to happen? Um, I've been involved in actions, by and large, they're like these. I see people who are closer to my parents' age than they are to my age. Uh, we're very fortunate. I see some young people here. That's very encouraging. And I think that uh, my opinion of my generation is that uh, we need to appeal to them by, by contouring our, our strategies and our actions to, to things that are, are appealing, uh, strategies that are appealing to them. Uh, we, we do really, really need practical approaches. If someone my age is able to see that his or her work is observably tied to something productive, something measurable, something that they can really see a difference, this, that, that'll be something that they might want to become involved with. If, it's, if it becomes too abstract or convoluted, if they start thinking, well, if I'm just standing on the side of the street holding a sign and getting people to honk at me every weekend, I just don't know that that's moving us toward where we want to be. And then maybe it is moving us toward where we want to be, but if, it, if someone my age isn't able to see that, then it might not be appealing enough to draw them in. And this is where uh, counter-recruiting really comes into play, because if you can reduce the numbers of young people going into the military, well, that's a very observable effect, and, and that's something that can really engender a sense of hope and a sense of accomplishment in, in the people in our movement. And that's only, that's only one creative idea. Uh, you know, I can't take credit for the idea of counter-recruiting. I think it's been around longer than I have. Unfortunately, it didn't reach me in 1999, and that's part of the reason I'm here. That's okay, though. Um, I think that... Uh, there's a lot of creative ideas that we can come up with, and especially the more young people that we're able to include in the movement, the more creative ideas we'll be able to generate. There's, there's a value in the seasoned experience that, that men and women like my father, who, who have protested the Vietnam War and everything since, bring to the table. And then there's a value to people who have no experience, and it's the interaction of those two generations that I think will be most optimal for our movement. Right now, we have uh, a lot of participation uh, from people in my father's generation, and that's great. Uh, we really need to figure out how we're gonna get people of other generations to get involved uh, to make it even better, I think. And also, one thing that's been despairing that I just wanna touch on very quickly is that um, in every event that I've ever been a part of, we speak uh, as of the Iraq war as though it were a problem. Uh, the Iraq war is not a problem. The Iraq war is just the part of the problem that you're able to see. Uh, it's, it's the effect, it's the 
symptom of the disease. And if it were not for the war in Iraq, we would have a war in Iran. If it weren't for uh, you know, these wars in the Middle East, we would have wars in the Far East. Um, it's, it's the foreign policy of this country, and this is, this is not really so much subject to dispute. I don't think that I, I think I probably have the consensus of the room when I say that, but you can review you know, the Project for New American Century and various documents. It's very explicit, it's very clear. The United States reserves the right to launch uh, preemptive military strikes against any country that it anticipates might be a threat to its uh, global dominance or its access to strategic markets and industries. The, the threats against the United States need not even be against our lives or our own personal security. If they threat, threaten our wealth, uh, any kind of military action, and any kind of military action is just the sort of military action we observe, is, is okay. It's, it's endorsed by our government, and uh, Iraq happens to have a great deal of oil, as I'm sure we're all, we all know, and that would be considered a strategic resource. That accounts for why we're there, and also that it's, it was at the time we attacked it, and it still is today, the most defenseless country um, of that part of the world. So when we come together and we talk about ending the war, I hope we're not talking about ending the Iraq war. Uh, we should be talking about ending the war that our country is waging against this world, the world's people, and anyone who has the unfortunate circumstance of living on top of resources that our wealthy elites desire.
first portion of the illustration, and on down. And I think what we need to understand is what's at the root of this, because while I don't think I have any really good ideas about exactly how to stop it, I think in order for us to figure out how to stop it, we have to understand what gives it so much impetus and so much energy. And to do that, I want to give a brief history of why we are in Iraq. Um, I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at it from the point of view of an article I read a couple of months ago that was titled, It's the Oil Stoop, which I think all of the, all of the people here have a sense of. But maybe uh, it's worth reviewing exactly how, um, how the oil in Iraq became the object of this massive war that we're now fighting. And I think that it's really uh, a part of the conjunction of three circumstances, all of which we need to understand very well in order to oppose it. The militarization of US foreign policy, the fall of the Soviet Union, which uh, is much more important than at least I ever thought until I started looking into this, and the energy crisis, which is real. And which our government is, of course, pursuing the worst possible route to resolve it. Um, and I want to start with a famous quote from a couple of years ago uh, Green, from a Federal Reserve Chairman Greenspan's book, in which he said, in one little casual sentence, on um, a deeply buried page of his book, but was immediately pulled out, and he said, I am saddened that it is politically inconvenient to acknowledge what everybody knows. The Iraq war is largely about oil. <clears throat> well, you know, this caused quite a furor, and it was labeled cocktail gossip, of a Georgetown cocktail gossip by various administration officials. So fortunately, Greenspan was asked to um, elaborate on this, and here's one of the elaborations he gave. It should be obvious that as long as the United States is beholden to potentially unfriendly sources of oil and gas, we are vulnerable to economic crisis over which we have little control. And he then elaborated a little bit further and said that that threat could be eliminated by one means or another, either by getting Saddam Hussein out of office or getting him out of the control position he was in, and that is, over the oil, right? Um, and in a way, that's kind of a complete summary of exactly what American foreign policy has become, which is that if you have a political opponent, somebody who has leverage over you, get, get this economic leverage over you, and they are unfriendly, then basically what you have to do is attack them, overthrow them, and put in a regime that's friendly, and maybe in addition to that, make sure that that regime that you put in doesn't have the power to exercise control over you. Right? And if you say, well, how, how would you do that? Right? Well, the actual way to do this in the case of oil is to privatize the oil and take it away from the national government. And in, and in, a cat, in this tiny little comment, Greenspan, you know, who was intimately involved in all this stuff for, for, for 35 years, is basically summarizing where American foreign policy has come to. Now, of course, it started a long time ago. You know, you can go back as far as World War II when the American diplomat commented about Middle Eastern oil, that it's a stupendous source of strategic power. Notice the part about power there and one of the world's greatest material prizes in history, right? So this, this combination, you not only want to have access to Middle Eastern oil for economic reasons, you want to have access to it for political reasons because then you'll have leverage over everybody else. This really, the, the current policy really began, um, you know, and I think a lot of people might have trouble believing this when um, that, uh, that pacifist president, Jimmy Carter, was in office. And, um, and you know, as much as I uh, admire some of the things he's doing now, he enunciated something called the Carter Doctrine in 1979. The Carter Doctrine announced that Persian Gulf oil was vital to American national interests and that the U.S. would use any means necessary, these are his, this is his language, any means necessary, sort of quoting Malcolm X, any means necessary, including military force, to ensure access to the, these, these riches. Right? And in order to back up his words with deeds, he formed a group called the Rapid Deployment Task, right, Rapid Deployment Force, which has evolved into CENTCOM, which is the military unit that is running the war in Iraq. He started that military unit. It was devised at the time they were supposed to be able to move into the Middle East militarily, full force militarily, within three months, 
Well, they got it down to three weeks later on. Um, and this sense that, the that our military should be poised and ready to intervene in the Middle East, of course, has you know, been godfathered down all through these years, right? And has always been a part, a very important part of American foreign policy. Um, now, that's one piece. That's one piece. Now, the second piece that happens is that um, in, 19, in 1990, we have the Gulf War, right? Which is the first, the first event that happens after the fall of the Soviet Union. And this is not trivial. This is, th these things are intimately connected. At the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, a Washington Post columnist uh, coined the term the unipolar moment. And what he meant by that was that all of a sudden, in this moment, the United States is now the sole superpower in the world. This idea, this concept of unipolar and the unipolar moment was picked up by the, neo the, the people who would later be called the neoconservatives who hadn't given themselves their own name yet, but they were immediately cottoned on to this idea, and the debate within the American political establishment was, how do you preserve the, the unipolar moment? And eventually, they you know, said, what we really want to do is we want to preserve the unipolar moment and establish an American century, right, in which the United States would be the sole hegemon in the world, the world leader, the source of law and order, and the policemen of the world. And this is the kind of the evolution of the ideas that informed the ultimate attack on Iraq. Now, of course, the, the, these neoconservatives were out of office during the Clinton administration, though Clinton himself endorsed the idea of the unipolar world and said, oh yes, we must maintain that the United States should be the sole arbiter of world peace, right? Um, and he was, and, and you know, he followed through on that, for example, by uh, dropping more bombs on Iraq than Bush had during the, Iraq, during the Gulf War. Um, Bush won. But in the meantime, the neoconservatives are talking about, have, have finally arrived at the idea that we should have regime change in Iraq. And in 1998, they sent a letter to, uh, to uh, an open letter to President Clinton that said you should turn your administration's attention to implementing a strategy for removing Saddam Hussein's regime from power. And of course they cited his military belligerence, but they also said that he had control over a significant portion of the world's supply of oil. That's from their document. Um, they always had the oil in mind. Then in their major policy statement, the Building America's Defenses, they, um, they said that they enunciated what has become the American policy, which they enacted when they got back into office, which is that a U.S. military preeminence should be utilized to secure and expand American influence in the world, including in the cases of North Korea and Iraq, they specifically mention them, it's possible use, and this is a quote from them, to remove these regimes from power and conduct post-combat stability operations, meaning that you're going to revolutionize these societies in the image of American policy. Now, they admitted in this document that it might be very hard to get the American people to go along with this, and it is true that it is very hard to get the American people to go along with aggressive wars. There have been ferocious protests in the past, and they were well aware of that. And they had this very uh, prophetic comment in this, in this document in which they said that it might require, in order to get the American people to go along with this, and this is a quote, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. It's actually in this document, it's been quoted by a lot of people now, but it's just so prescient that, you know, every person who has a paranoid view of 9-11 knows about this one, right? Because it certainly, you know, it, it certainly is, um, is, is, a worrisome, is a worrisome comment. Well, okay, that's prong number two. So now we have this, this idea that the United States should be the world hegemon and use its military in order to uh, impose itself. And then the third thing that happens is that the energy crisis really sort of takes on a life of its own. And, um, and the 1990s is a terrible time for energy, right? And it's when a lot of us became aware that we we're approaching the energy crisis and also the global warming crisis, which is deeply connected with it. And this whole set of environmental concerns, right, have all arisen at the same time. For the United States, the real, the real sound, the first really warning sound was, um, 
was the Gulf War itself, the first Gulf War, because Iraqi and Kuwaiti oil was off the market for six months. And during that six months, there was no replacement. It was the first time that a shortage of oil was not replaced by surplus capacity, largely from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabians, for one reason or another, probably because they couldn't, were unable to cover the shortage. And that triggered the recession that followed the war, which in turn triggered Bush's loss of the election, which ironically, you know, the war that was supposed to win in the election lost in the election by triggering the recession. But what everybody learned, everybody in the world learned was is that this terrible thing that certain economists and oil geologists had been predicting for 20 years was on its way, which is what's called peak oil. But actually what the real crisis is is that the demand for oil is very close to the supply of oil. And so anytime you get any perturbation in the supply of oil, there's actually a shortage, you get price spikes, and you also get shortages, and those shortages result in economic dislocations of various sorts. And nobody in the world can escape it. You can't escape it just by not needing, not needing foreign oil. These oil shortages affect everybody, and of course they affect different places differentially. So what happens in the 90s is this problem gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and Greenspan again is saying, you know, we've got such a, such a, a problem between supply and demand that we have to, uh, uh, that we have to do something about it because the, the economic instability it's gonna cause is tremendous. Now, of course, the thing that should have been done right then and there was, okay, we have to go for conservation and alternate sources. Right? And a lot of people were making those claims, but American policymakers had no intention to go in that direction. And what happens when you, when you reach 2001 and the Bush administration is coming into power is they put in the Cheney Energy Task Force, which we all thought was being secret because they were in bed with the energy companies. But the real reason it was being kept secret is what they were saying is we're coming up with a, guess what, a military solution to the shortage of oil. And the military solution worked out to be that they figured out that if you went into the Middle East and you went at breakneck speed and you opened up all the oil reserves there and you sucked it out with the most modern possible machinery that you could possibly put in there with a $100 billion investment, you could, for somewhere between five and 15 years, double their production, and therefore buy yourself five years. Now the only trouble is no Middle Eastern country was gonna do that voluntarily, because it's crazy, right? For them it's crazy, they don't, they don't, if they let it go, go slowly, the price is gonna go up and up and up over time, right? They're gonna make a lot more money. The only place they have to invest in super oil problems, right? They're not gonna spend it on their people there, right? is to invest it in this rotten American economy that's losing them money. So they don't, wanna, they don't wanna do any of this, so you're gonna have to force them to do it. And what they arrived at was, let's, let's start with Iraq, because Iraq is the perfect target. And, um, and this, by the way, is in January, February, March of 2001. This is before 9-11, right? They're already talking about this. This is uh, Secretary of the Treasury O'Neill speaking. Actual plans were already being discussed to take over Iraq and occupy it, complete with the disposition of oil fields, peacekeeping forces, war crimes tribunals, carrying forward an unspoken doctrine of prevent, preemptive war, right? This is, this is before 9-11, they're already talking about it, but they know that they need a Pearl Harbor. So when 9-11 comes, Rumsfeld goes in on 9-12 to the National Security Council and says, let's attack Iraq. And they had this big debate for three days where they're gonna attack Iraq, which everybody knew had nothing to do with 9-11, or Afghanistan, they decided, well, we'll attack Iraq after Afghanistan. And that's the, that's the origin of the war in Iraq, is that this, this convergence of forces at work long before 9-11, a militarized foreign policy, an amplification of that militarized foreign policy, the ratcheting up of the energy crisis, the determination not to go into conservation and, and alternate fuels, but to go for an amplification of the oil production. And here's Rumsfeld talking about what his vision is of the uh, attack on Iraq. Uh, imagine what the region would look like without Saddam Hussein and with a regime that's allied with U.S. interests. It would change everything in the region and beyond. There's an apocalyptic view, right? The United States is going to take over this region 
and we're going to become the world hegemon. And then just in case, and just in case that wasn't explicit enough, this is a David Fromm, who was a Bush, a Bush speechwriter at the same time, explaining this point. An American-led overthrow of Saddam Hussein and the replacement of the radical Ba'athist dictatorship with a new government more closely aligned with the United States, get this, would put America more fully in charge of the region than any power since the Ottomans, or maybe even the Romans. Right? I mean, it's just a complete imperial vision, right? Okay? And this is what we're up against, right? This is what we have to fight, is we have to fight this vision of the idea about how to resolve various problems in the world is for the United States to basically become the world dictator. Right? That's what they're up to, and that's why they, they've been getting their ass handed to them in Iraq, let's face it, right? And the oil production is down in Iraq, right? But they keep on fighting, you know, we're waist deep in the mid the, the, the big money, and the big fool says to march on because this is what they're trying to achieve. Thank you. It's off now, but I'm up. Okay. Okay, be careful. No, it doesn't like the speaker. Huh? Uh -huh. It's I can't do it. Yeah, if I can do it handheld. Right, maybe it's this sitting on it. I don't know. But you see, as soon as I turn it on, it gets, no, because watch what happens, see? Okay, can you hear me now? No. How about now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and now I have no more time. <laughs> no, this is not working. I, I, I would need to uh, introduce Dahlia. Oh, okay. That's good. Okay, um, okay Dr. Dahlia Wasley is an internationally known speaker and activist. Born in the United States, to an American Jewish mother and an Iraqi Muslim father. She lived in Iraq as a child, returning to the U.S. at age five. After graduating from Swarthmore College with a BA in biology in 1993, she earned her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997. Dr. Wasfi has made two trips to Iraq to visit her extended family since the 2003 shock and awe invasion, including a three-month stay in Basra in the spring of 2006. She has brought her eyewitness account of life under occupation to 21 United States, Capitol Hill in D.C., Madrid, Spain in 2007, and the third international Iraq conference in Berlin, Germany in March 2008. Based on her experiences, Dr. Wasfi is speaking out in support of immediate, unconditional withdrawal of American forces from Iraq and the need to end the occupation from the Nile to the Euphrates. Her website is, I want to make a note of this, 
www.livealatethis.com. Jalia, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. I hope there's not too much feedback from this. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I've uh, had the honor of speaking with Dan and Michael before, and it's wonderful to be here tonight. Uh, but I did tell Evan that the panel was imbalanced because you brought a Sunni professor and there's no Shia professor. <laughs> so that's a new joke. I, that's just for you guys. So, and unfortunately, that's the last new joke, so if you've heard me speak before, just bear with me. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, women and children first, the first targets of U.S. foreign policy, and just basically to really put into human terms uh, what uh, you've already heard about, because when it comes down to it, it's the graphic humanity uh, that we need to understand and understand why Iraqis are fighting so hard to get us out. I am going to show you images of occupation. Um, oh, and actually, before I forget, if you can keep um, the camera on me, uh, <laughs> because I like it, um, and, uh, but I do show uh, family photos, and I'm, uh, I'm paranoid about them, so if you just don't show those, thank you. Um, into this one? A little more? Okay, I'm afraid of it. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, I show the images of occupation, ba basically what I do is I'm going door to door doing what the mainstream media did in Vietnam to show the reality of war because the Iraqi people don't get an edited version, the Iraqi children don't get an edited version, and American soldiers don't get an edited version, which is why an average of 15 soldiers and marines are attempting suicide every day. Um, if there are any children in the room, I don't see anybody on a cursor review who needs their parents' permission, but sometimes there are kids in my audience, so I let the parents decide, and then once again, there's my website. Um, if I could, I don't want to um, take too much from, uh, I, I don't want to disrespect the organizers, but if I could, I'll take the five minutes closing and, not, and just not say anything then um, and use it now. So um, here's what y'all came here to hear tonight. Let me tell you about me. These are my parents, uh, my dad from Basra, Iraq, Iraq's second largest city. It's in the south near the, near the border with Kuwait. He was born and raised there and graduated from secondary school and uh, did well enough, or then moved on, didn't have to do well enough, it's free education. So he went to uh, Baghdad University, College of Sciences, and did well enough there to earn a government scholarship to do his graduate studies overseas. So he ended up coming to the United States, was studying at Georgetown University and living in DC where he happened to meet another graduate student, a nice Jewish girl from New York. Now, with uh, an Arab father and Jewish mother, although those groups are not mutually exclusive, there are many Arab Jews, but with an Arab father and an Ashkenazi Jewish mother, I am 100% Semite. So you could insult either side of my family and that would be anti-Semitic, but let's wait for the Q&A. And then the other point is that with an Arab father and Jewish mother, I'm going to be in therapy for a long, long time. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Uh, my parents got married in 1968, had my sister in 1969, and then their lives dramatically improved in 1971 when I came along. Now there might be, thank you, thank you. There might be a difference of opinion on an exit strategy from Iraq, but I think we can all agree I was a very cute baby. Now, I make that point because we can't all get along. We're in unison here. Let's build on that unity. Now, I show this picture not only for the gratuitous applause, though I appreciate it, but this is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, this is me six months old, and this is in our backyard in Iraq. Uh, after my dad finished his uh, PhD, he had to pay back that government scholarship by teaching at Basra University for five years. So he finished in August 71, I was born in December 71. The first five years of my life were back and forth between Iraq and New York, uh, or the state. And uh, when you're a kid, you think everybody does that, but anyway. Uh, the memories I have of Iraq look like this. For any of us, uh, the memories of our childhood before the time that our brain could make memories are from the pictures. So you talk to me about Iraq, and I think of this. But unfortunately, most people don't think of this. They think of this. And therein lies the problem. You pick any country on the face of our planet and it is made up of families. And it is those families who pay the price for the actions of their leadership. Sometimes they reap the benefits. These days, most often, they're paying the price. 
whether it's the over 4,500 families who've lost their loved ones in a war based on lies in Iraq and Afghanistan, whether it's the people of New Orleans who close to three years now after Hurricane Katrina hit have yet to be able to return home, whether it's the people in Minneapolis who fell to their deaths because while we send billions and give billions to American corporations and mercenary companies, there's the infrastructure in this country is falling apart, or whether you're talking about the 26 million, the families who make up Iraq, who are paying the ultimate price in our continued occupation. Now this is an Iraqi family, that's my dad, my sister on the right, and me. And this is an American family. There's my dad, my sister on the right, and me. See, we all look alike. I was born in New York. I was born in Manhattan, though I'm scared of New York today. Um, my sister was born in DC, and my dad became a citizen in the 1980s. So when you talk to me about shock and awe of Iraq, you might as well tell me that you're going to shock and awe Yonkers, New York, because it's the same thing to me. These were my grandparents. Ashkenazi Jews who fled their homeland of Austria during Hitler's Anschluss. They came to New York, they came to Yonkers and settled down and were able to start a new life. Unfortunately, now I have genocide on both sides of my family, so it's for both sides of my family and my new family today, the people I've met uh, on this journey. Uh, it's for all of them that I do what I do and all of you who have made the time to come out here today and I appreciate that. This is my father. This is the standard graduation photo that you will find in 99% of the homes in Iraq. Uh, the same thing today. I've seen it in my, uh, my, cousins, uh, my cousins on the wall. And this is when he graduated in 1961 from the College of Sciences. I just found this photo at my uncle's house in 2006 and I brought it home to my dad and he said, you look at how handsome I am. I said, yes, and you're very humble too. But, so now you know where I got it from. Anyway, now when he graduated, this is graduation day and there you see my father in the middle there. And I just want to point out, oh my goodness, I see arms, bare arms on the women. 1961 in Iraq. Only she has her hair covered, but you see the women are dressed pretty Western, um, uh, Western appearance. All right, if you could handle that one, I'm going to show you this one. People, flower dresses, no sleeves, okay? And nobody's covering their hair. Uh, here's my dad graduating, and this is how the women dressed in 1961. Please don't take pictures. Um, but I want to show you, when I came back in 2004, this is how we left the house. We deposed a secular government and have ushered in theocratic rule. So this is the reality for women in Iraq, especially in the South where the most of my family is. Um, and uh, this is because the, if, if we're arguing that the Americans need to stay to prevent Iran from taking over, um, that's a done deal. The Iranian militias who, uh, with, for the conservative parties, of whom Nouri al-Maliki and Ibrahim Jafari before him are a member, they have come in to, claim, uh, to lay claim to Nejaf and Karbala, which are the holiest Shia cities. So that's a done deal. Now international law as far, well, it should be before that, but uh, specifically UN Security Council Resolution 1325 recognizes the suffering of women and children back in October of 2000 and calls upon all parties to armed conflict to respect fully international law applicable to the rights and protection of women and girls, especially as civilians, in particular the obligations applicable to them under the Geneva Conventions of 1949. The Geneva Conventions, a little something that was passed by the international community to try to make sure that what happened to civilians in World War II would happen never again. In addition to that, in 1989, Conventions on the Rights of the Child was approved and we are party to and responsible to obey and enforce these laws. But in reality, on the ground in Iraq, Iraqi women and children are paying the highest price. Before shock and awe in March of 2003, we had destroyed the healthcare system, we had used depleted uranium, and the impact of economic sanctions had punished women and children. After March of 2003, those three elements were still at play, but on top of it, they lost security. There is a refugee crisis, and that ushered in prostitution, drugs, and HIV. And so these are the images I hope you will remember. Uh, when we see Arabs or Muslims in the media, it's typically young military-aged male. They're angry, they're dressed in black, they have their faces covered. Uh, to hide their identity, they're chanting in a language we don't understand, and they're carrying weapons. 
so that it's a confusion over the population. Now, do the math with me. Any country, about half male, half female. Add up the women, the girls, and the boys. The majority of any country is women and children. So when we don't see images of Arab women and children or Muslim women and children, it's a subliminal message that there's something different about them. They are separate from us. They don't respect life the way we do. But in reality, women and children are paying the highest price. Oh, there's two more cuties. I won't even recognize the little one today. She should be now two years old and her older sister four years old. This is from 2006. So the uh, public health infra infrastructure incapacitated by the Gulf War, once known as the jewel of the Arab world, identified as a first-class range of medical facilities, was knocked out of commission by the first Gulf War where we targeted electrical power plants, uh, excuse me, electrical grids and water sewage treatment plants. As a result, there was massive disease outbreak and limited capacity to treat it, and primary health care services ceased to exist. Three major causes of morbidity and mortality for children under five, lower respiratory infections, diarrhea, and measles and other vaccine preventable diseases. All conditions that are easily treatable if you have the materials and you have the personnel. But we block that. And to this day, respiratory infections and diarrhea account for 70% of the deaths of children under five. What would we do if another country's policy made sure or was causing that 70% of the deaths of children under five? We'd have a problem with it. Depleted uranium, just briefly, DU is radioactive waste that the Pentagon found a use for. If you formulate it into rods and hit a, missile, hit a tank with it, it cuts through that tank like a hot knife through butter, which is very exciting if you're the Pentagon. But on impact, depleted uranium bursts into flames and goes into tiny microscopic particles, like spraying a spray can, and then you can't see it. It goes to the air and the sand and the water supply for the people. It's tons of microscopic radioactive contamination, and when the Pentagon sent their number one guy to investigate it, Doug Rocky, he came back and said, don't ever use this again. You shouldn't have used it in the first place because it lingers for years just four and a half billion, but who's counting? Uh, and you need to inform the civilian population of what you've done here, and you need to inform returning veterans. And every returning veteran needs to be tested for exposure, because if they have problems arising from that exposure, they're entitled to benefits. Well, the test itself for a DU uh, exposure, the blood test, is $1,000 a shot. Cheney wasn't about to spend that kind of money, and certainly not pay out benefits to all those veterans who are suffering complications. One third of returning veterans, which is now somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million soldiers of, desert, of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, one third are presenting to the VA with medical complaints and the VA cannot handle it. And they certainly aren't gonna be willing to pay out benefits to all of these individuals. And the Pentagon said, Doug, thank you so much, you're fired. On the other side, in Iraq, after the first Gulf War, there was a 600% increase in Iraq's infant mortality rate and 300% increase in the incidence of pediatric leukemias and lymphomas. Cancers that because we blocked uh, chemotherapeutic agents from entering Iraq for the argument they could be used to manufacture we chemical weapons, 100% fatality for these children. Economic sanctions, as many of you know, imposed on August 6, 1990, blocking Iraq from selling oil which was 95% of their economy. It also blocked the import of goods and this affected, uh, uh, this limited reconstruction of the infrastructure that was damaged during the first Gulf War. By 1995, the UNICEF, UNICEF was reporting that economic sanctions were yielding a minimum of political dividends against a high human price paid primarily by women and children. The food rationing system that had begun after the imposition of sanctions was providing less than 60% of the required daily caloric intake, and the water sanitation systems were still uh, destroyed and shortages of life-saving drugs were there. This brought in the oil for food program, which we know was rife with corruption uh, because Saddam Hussein was selling oil on the black market and he was getting fat during sanctions while the people suffered. Who was he selling oil to? Halliburton. CEO, Dick Cheney. By 1997, nearly one million children in southern and central Iraq are chronically malnourished. This is an increase of 72% since 1991. 
There was no poverty in Iraq prior to the imposition of economic sanctions. What the UNICEF rep in Baghdad said was that it is clear that children are bearing the brunt of the current economic hardship. This is what you saw in Iraq. Anywhere from two to five babies in one incubator. Number one, they fit. Number two, if an incubator breaks, sanctions prevented a new one from coming in or replacement parts for an old one. Number three, because the electrical grids were damaged for the rolling blackouts, it requires less gas to run one uh, generator than two. There's your malnutrition, and this is where most of the children ended up. This is a children's cemetery in Baghdad. And just want to point out that this is February 11, 2003. And now here we come to shock and awe. So March 19, 2003 to the present. This is the reality of war. This is what children are growing up in today. No access to health care anymore. No access to education anymore. This is shock and awe and mission accomplished because you see this little one should have a, a breathing tube in their mouth to protect the airway because of the proximity of the burns to the oral cavity. And also, there's lacking that equipment, lacking that personnel, and also, as you can see, lacking pain medication. This is what war and occupation look like. So as we saber rattle towards Iran and Syria and North Korea and every other country that dares to threaten the value of the dollar, this is the image we should have in mind. Shall we do this to their children? Now, the, the majority of this is actually childbirth, so hopefully the guys will be all right with the picture. But this was an emergency cesarean section, and there's the placenta. This was an emergency because the mother was shot in the abdomen. And if you watch the movie The Ground Truth, interviews with veterans of, desert, of, sorry, of Operation Enduring Freedom, you will hear them talk about shooting at pregnant women. It happens quite frequently at checkpoints because obviously people are speeding to get to the hospital. But what you see here, the mother was shot in the abdomen. Now, depleted uranium damaged a lot of fetuses. But you see this one was a healthy fetus, a healthy child, now born with hopefully 10 fingers, 10 toes, one entrance wound, and one exit wound. Happy birthday from the United States of America. This is the reality on the ground. They don't hate our freedoms. They hate us because our policies are killing their families. So after March 2003, with increased patience, increased death and destruction, there is no law and order, a refugee crisis beyond proportion, and prostitution. Health indicators in Iraq today, 68% of Iraqis have no access to safe drinking water. 19% of Iraqis have sewerage access. The majority of the country experiences sewage in the streets, which is a public health problem. It would be problematic here in New York. Diarrheal disease continues to this day. Cholera is endemic in Iraq. It is due to the destruction of the electric electricity and sewage treatment plants and overcrowded conditions. So with mass refugees, two and a half million outside the country, two and a half million inside the country, everything is escalated. 70% of child deaths today caused by easily treatable conditions. Since the invasion in 2003, through the period, uh, that three year period till October 2006, 270,000 children born and received no immunizations. Depleted uranium. The first Gulf War, we used over 300 tons. Today, we've now used over 2,000 tons. We are now seeing evidence of increased cancer cases in Baghdad since March 2003, whereas before they were concentrated where we used depleted uranium in Basra. There is no security after, the, after invasion. Women and children anywhere around the world where there is no law and order, women and children are the most susceptible to violence. They're susceptible to violence and kidnapping. And in the Lancet report, the number one cause of death for children and women uh, was, uh, sorry, the aerial bombing raids were the most significant cause for civilian morbidity and mortality because pilots two miles in the air can't see who's sitting in those houses. And usually when you hear insurgent safe house or insurgent stronghold, that's a neighborhood. People live there. And women and children are hiding in their homes to stay out of the violence we've brought to their streets. In Iraq, uh, May two 2007, the State of the World's Mother's Report said that in Iraq, the chance that a child will live beyond age five 
has plummeted faster than anywhere else in the world since 1990, since about the time that we showed up. Prostitution, HIV, and drugs, today over a million are widowed and orphaned. 50,000 Iraqi refugees forced into prostitution, many of them have no other means of earning uh, a, a living. Uh, if their husbands have they go to Syria and Jordan, they, they can't get work permits uh, officially uh, because Syria and Jordan are protecting their, their own population's uh, economy. So they have to resort to prostitution. This was unheard of before we were involved. Uh, and now, if you cannot work legally, survival sex is, uh, is the method uh, that they resort to. And that's an article in MSNBC. Once again, UN Security Council resolution calls on all parties to armed conflict to take special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, particularly rape and other forms of sexual abuse. In the U.S. military today, 